Hello and welcome. I'm Doug Piper, and today we're taking a deep dive into the world of New Zealand hops. We have an exceptional treat because we have an in-depth conversation with hop guru Stan Hieronymus. We're going to take you deep behind the scenes of the 2023 New Zealand hop harvest, and it will follow the impact of technological advancements to insights and specific hop varieties. Stan will cover it all, and he also delves into the intricacies of the hop industry amidst challenges impacted by the pandemic. He further shares intriguing details about sustainability practices in hop farming. And this is not just about hops and harvests. Stan unravels the art of hop blending. He hints at future trends in the industry and even provides a sneak peek into experimental hops. Now, there's a lot to explore here, so stick with us. And you'd especially want to stay to the very end where Stan unveils his prediction about the impact of the changing weather patterns on hop farming. It is a game-changing perspective that's worth watching. So let's get started. Here's our full-length interview with Stan Hieronymus. In light of recent investments amounting to millions of dollars in expanding New Zealand's hop acres, it seems like we're seeing a surge in the popular varieties like Nelson Savon. Did I say it right? Yeah, Nelson, Nelson Sauvignon. Sauvignon. And the formerly elusive Rewaka and the emergence of newcomers like uh, Nectaron and Superdele. Can you share what kind of sets these cultivars apart and makes them incredibly unique compared to what we can get you know, here in the United States or elsewhere? Before we go deeper into why, I want to read something that Peter Darby, one of the leading experts on hop breeding in the world, is a longtime hop breeder in the UK. He had he retired a couple of years ago. He still does freelance breeding. So some of the French hops that you might have had an experience with, for instance, are actually hops that he bred. And talking about the New Zealand hops and hops overall, he's, he said this, English flavor is like a chamber orchestra the hops giving simultaneously the high notes and the bass notes. In comparison, a Czech beer is more like a full orchestra with much more breadth and sound. An American hop gives more of a dance band with more volume and brass, and that's certainly true. The recent New Zealand hops, e.g. Nelson Sobin, are like adding a voice to the instrumental music. And I think that really also begins to explain the why that they are different is they are true hybrids. And any hop that you're using now is a hybrid. Even at some point in time, Saz, you had a male pollinate, a female plant. The Saz hop was created. The farmer said, this is the hop we like. And at that point, they would clone it after that. Uh, more often, the hops you have are, are hybrids, uh, are products of intentional breeding, like Citra or Mosaic. Uh, in the case of the New Zealand hops, they have the same base. So that they have American qualities and European qualities. They began a breeding program about 50 years ago to breed hops that grow well in New Zealand and also represent the New Zealand climate really nicely. Um, so that, that's the thing that makes them unique. I, I would not say that they are better than American hops or Australian hops and certainly land race hops, but they are different. Um, and one reason was the intent of the breeding program. Another reason, of course, is uh, New Zealand climate, uh, a word used more often by wine people, which is the terroir. Uh, and it, it, they reflect the land in which they grow. And that means not just the dirt that they grow from, uh, for instance, um, you you have some very nice hops growing in clay soil and excellent hops. M more often, uh, the hops you really like are in alluvial soil. Uh, but there are other factors. Or, or what? Repeat that again. The, the, what kind of soil? You can see it, it's, you've got a clay soil. Uh, for instance, so that the hop, the hop growing region uh, where almost all the farms are now, there are a few farms uh, that are moving into new areas to see if they get a different terroir. 
but most hops are grown and all the hops you're getting right now are in the Nelson region. Um, the, uh, Nelson region that there are quite a <clears throat> few grapes grown there as well, but you have also got the, the famous hop growing regions and where they grow Sauvignon Blanc wine. There are also some great Pinots, Pinot Noir are grown there. And you'll have a discussion with the grape growers about the importance of clay and the quality of the fruit versus an alluvial cell, soil, which is one that drains better. And, and there are certain hop varieties that, that for instance, uh, Mac hops, which is the largest farm in the co-op, um, which are the, the, those are the only farms you can get nectar on or super delic from, for instance. They, he actually has two different farms, different farther apart. He'll only grow nectar on in one because, uh, which I think is the one with alluvial soil, because it, it doesn't grow very well on clay. So that that's one difference. Um, probably more important, it, it's a little closer to the equator than the U.S. Northwest regions, and they have forty percent more ultraviolet light UV than the similar latitude in the Northern Hemisphere. So that intensity seems to be a factor in resulting in these hops, which just have a little bit more pop and a little bit brighter. So almost in its simplest form, I think I'm hearing that what we used to in the U.S. were cultivated with European roots. But you're saying... So real quickly, uh, hops uh, go back about six million years, and they originate in Mongolia. About a million or a million and a half years ago, um, one branch spits, splits off and moves into all of Europe. We're talking Scandinavia down to northern Africa. And those are humulus, were always known as humulus lupulus. And that was the hop. Uh, until the begin, end of the 19th century, the belief was there was just one. However, about a half million years later, another branch slid off and comes across like the Bering Strait into North America, certainly into Canada and the U.S., uh, at least as far south as the Southwest. And there are three different um, categories of those, uh, but but they are... The key thing is that they are distinct from the Europeans. So they have qualities. So you think about what's driving interest in hops right now, which is thiols, um, and also an additional higher amounts of geranial, for instance. So some of these attributes are more common in the American varieties, which would be lupuloidus primarily. Almost everything is lupuloidus. There's a there's a sexiness to neomexicanus, and people are excited about neomexicanus. It is certainly changes the Savro hop, but it's really lupuloitis that, that has been the driving factor genetically. So at the beginning of the 20th century, New Zealand is old. New Zealand hasn't had humans living there all that long, maybe 700 years. And settlers from England and Europe, not until the middle of the 19th century, they brought their hops from Germany and England. They did not do well. So at the beginning of the 20th century, they uh, imported some hops from Sonoma County, uh, which is where Russian liver, River is located. And we'll circle back to that in a moment. Um, it's, they're known as uh, Cali Cluster. And Cluster was the dominant hop. Cluster is a cross probably between an English hop and an American wild hop. So again, you have a natural hybrid in this situation, and it has all the characteristics that you get in an American hop variety. In the region I mentioned, Sonoma County, uh, nectar on hop is that that is a combination of nectar of the gods, meant to talk about uh, its flavor and aroma, and Ron, and that's named for Ron Beetson, who was the longtime hop breeder in New Zealand, recently retired. Um, Craft Brewers Conference, which you talked about, um, Ron came to that on his way. He stopped at Russian River and did a collab brew with Finney, as a matter of fact. And, and he was excited to do this because he says, Hey, this, 
this hop that has been central to the aroma and flavor that you get in New Zealand varieties actually came from Sonoma County. Wow. That brings it full circle. Um, yeah. So, so back to what, the, again, the exciting amount of, about dials, uh, which, which you have in some of those uh, New Zealand varieties, probably a result of their American heritage. So the three factors there are um, the breeding program, which comes from the crosses, um, their terroir, and then an effort now uh, for growers to better understand how to take advantage of that terroir. Uh, and the same thing is going on uh, all around the world, certainly in the American Northwest, kind of resetting picking windows. Um, when, when you are going to put your, your plant, begin training it when you want to get it to the top of the wire, when you're going to harvest it. There, there's a whole set of research around those things. Uh, and New Zealand kind of represents that, but it's not the, they're certainly not the only ones doing it. So I was fortunate enough to be given some packages of, of hops. So you're, you're saying this uh, Nectaron that I'm holding right here actually goes back to Sonoma County. It, but part of it, it there's, there are many generations of breeding in there. But yes, it has uh, uh, the Cali cluster is part of his heritage at the top of its family tree, so to speak. Wow. It, it, I don't know if you've noticed over there, Stan, we've got a couple of people from New Zealand. Hey, uh, Cam. <laughs> yes. So I, I've been, been to, uh, and it's a rainy day. Uh, well, I've been to Ken's farm. It's one of the farms I've visited. Um, and I, I think, it's different than every other farm, and that shows you how eclectic the hops can be from New Zealand. Uh, you've got not quite 30 brewers in the co-op, uh, but I think I, the second thing we promised to talk about is why all of a sudden are you going to be able to buy, get more of these hops in the United States? You know, there's a period where, you know, Nelson Sobin would cost you an arm and two legs usually uh, to get it. It's super expensive. It's not going to get a lot cheaper, but it's going to get easier to get your hands on it, and it won't be as expensive. But you've had a massive expansion, which is people coming in investing in larger farms. So so when I went to Kem's farm or when I went to Katari, Katuri, however you pronounce their name, there that's a smaller farm as well. So you, you see this little different approach um, and a little tighter connection to the hops. That doesn't mean one is better than the other, but they're different. So uh, Hop Revolution is has, actually has two very large farms, uh, totally modern picking equipment, um, two different ways of doing it, two different ways of killing your hops um, than uh, Clayton's. Um, actually have four farms that they put in uh, and they're, they're part of the co-op, but they also are independent. And then Freestyle Hops, uh, which actually uh, bought Kim's uncle's farm uh, and which was the largest farm and they have expanded that as well. So that's why you're beginning to get more availability of those hops. And the co-op is expanded uh, as well so that they're growing more of the hops. In, in the case of uh, Kim, and I think he's got about 75 acres, well, one third of that are Ruwaka. And, and people, Ruwaka is not that easy to grow. I talked to a half dozen growers and each of them has a different opinion how to approach Ruwaka. You know, when to train it, uh, when you want it to the top of the wire, uh, how mature you want it. When it works, though, um, so I, I bought Cure Luck. I had a, a beer from Duncan's uh, with uh, fresh Rewaka hops from Kem's Farm, as a matter of fact. Um, it had been canned that day, which gives it somewhat an advantage. And it just, you know, when you pop the can open, it was just, it just was a 
blast uh, of this bright tropical aroma. And it's hard, you know, it almost cut like a knife. Um, it, it was just super intense. I certainly get that sometimes with with hops from the U.S. as well, uh, and or hop, beers brewed in the U.S. with New Zealand hops. I was fortunate to, uh, I think that's upside down. There we go. Uh, to be given a packet like this, which I think is a couple of ounces. And, and you were talking about the expenses. Let's see, this looks like almost four ounces. So what, what do you see those costs being in comparison to American hops? Well, it, it, in the past, if certain, some people had contracts, but very few had contracts and, and Nelson Sullivan's the, the best example. Um, then it, when it would show up on a Lupulin exchange, uh, it, quite often would be $30 a pound. Um, and compared to Citra, which is 12 to 15 pound dollars a pound, for instance, Lupin okay. exchange, you can kind I, I, you know, it's, uh, more, more than double probably. Hmm? What's that? More than double. Yeah. So it, it and I don't know what it's going to cost now. Um, but at some point it becomes more available. Uh, I, that's the first thing when you can get it and you can get it in, good condition as well. Um, and, and again, one more time, I'll return it to Kim's arm. So, so two things is that there was only one processing plant for a long time in New Zealand. And now there will be, Kim does his own, Clayton's are going to have their own. The co-op has theirs. Hop Revolution ships a lot of hops to get processed at Crosby hops. Um, the co-op now is shipping. It is now partners with YCH hops, uh, Yakima chief hops. And that means that there will be cryo of, uh, all the varieties that the co-op sells. So you, you see you all you got this availability of, of the new products as well. So I think that's another factor. So before we move on to kind of the next section we were talking about, how would you summarize? Because it's a little confusing for me now. I thought I had this somewhat figured out. I mean, the, what I love about the New Zealand hops is I love the tropical characteristics. To to me, it's maybe one of the most delicious hops that I've ever really uh almost fallen in love with versus other hops. It seems like they had to kind of grow on me. Um, and this distinctive nature is pretty unique in all the hops I've ever, ever had been exposed to. So as I've heard you mention UV and, and terroir. Is there two or three things that you think, you know, create that tropical uniqueness? The higher levels of what uh, a big thing, what everybody's focused on right now are thiols. And, and the case of Nelson Sullivan is a good example because it's been studied more. Uh, that there, there's nobody's done a check yet to say what the thiol levels are in Nectaron or Superdelic. Um, but we know about Nelson Sullivan. So of, of the, the, the thiols, and I won't give you long names, just their, uh, their numbers and initials. Um, the early excitement was about 4MMP. Uh, Citra has quite a bit of 4MMP. You know, that was identified, uh, and people started looking for hops with, with a 4MMP, a free 4MMP. On its own, 4MMP smells like a tomato plant, not a tomato, a tomato plant, uh, sometimes chives, black currant, and in large amounts, like a cat litter box. It's not very positive. When it interacts, so with synergy, the word biotransformation gets used all the time. This is not a biotransformation. It's a synergy uh, with geranial, linalool, and other compounds that hang out with them. That gets you the tropical. On the other hand, you'll get more grapefruit, citrus, passion fruit from 3MH, 
3MHA and 3M4MP. Uh, and, and like I said, the passion fruit. And you can get the wine like character. And in the case of 3M4MP, some rhubarb. Those are in, in a free form in Nelson Sova. Some of these other varieties, they're bound, uh, meaning they're precursors. They need to be freed by the yeast. Most yeast varieties are not good at that. That's why you have a rise now of dialyzed yeast that's sold <clears throat> uh, primarily by uh, Omega yeast and Berkeley yeast. Uh, and those are freeing those compounds. Uh, that Those same precursors also exist in barley malt. So th those yeast can give you those flavors without any hops being in the beer. So Dan, thing, you know, I, I, normally, I normally like to have uh, a commercial calibration beer. And and I thought, oh, this will this will be easy. I'll, I'll look for some widely distributed beers with some uh, known New Zealand hops. Well, that I, I contacted everybody I knew, and it was kind of like, nope, sorry, we don't have them. Don't have them. Don't have them. Okay, so so obviously there's there's all this talk and popularity, and we've got samples of them, but they don't seem to have made them at least into widely distributed beers. So is that going to change with all this investment that's going on now in New Zealand? And I've seen Brian says they've got a processing facility and uh, that we've got some hot growers in there. It sounds like things are picking up. Or, or are we going to see it in more commercial beers, you think? Um, yeah, um, certainly. They Literally, acreage has tripled in the last seven years. Um, and that they'll still be at about 3000 acres. There are farms bigger in the Northwest than that. Um, but there'll be a lot more hops. They export 90% of their hops and, uh, back to Brian, Brian, uh, sorry that I, I can never pronounce the, the, the pick guy, my, wh whatever is, <laughs> I didn't mean to leave them out. So, so you see the, the volumes picking up. And, and that hopefully one day we can do this again and actually have a widely distributed beer that will have some New Zealand hops in it. Well, it's funny when you sent me the note about beers uh, and I said, well, I'm not drinking beer today because I'm going to the airport when I'm done with this. Um, is, uh, I, I, and it's gone now, but I had, uh, we can get here in Colorado, the hop, hop butcher for the world from Chicago and, and they use a lot of New Zealand hops. Um, other, other half, I, I saw this on Instagram yesterday was, uh, brewing a collab with NZ hops, which imports Nectaron using the Nectaron cryo, which YCH has, has just cryoized or however, whatever we want to make that brew. Well, I think this, this makes a huge case and, and I didn't play in a hit or I would have done this, but. You know, I was, I was talking to Charlie Papazian, I guess, about a year ago. And I said, gosh, Charlie, we all look great crap beers out there. Why, why bother to homebrew anymore? We, we get all these great beers, but this is a great example. I mean, if you really want to experience New Zealand hops, well, you can probably find them and you can brew your own because you just probably won't find it anywhere else. Yeah, I, I, th I think because they're... As they become more of them, and there's some fun new things you can do with it. I was talking about somebody talking to a couple of brewers who are going to do a collab um, with the idea that one is brewing essentially an IPA and the other uh, a lager, which means it's going to be a cold IPA, where one uses uh, uh, one hop variety on the hot side, that, or variety A on the hot side, and variety B on the cold side. The other one uses B on the hot side and A on the cold side. And to see what sort of differences you get when you put those two together. So, you know, and obviously a homebrew club could do something like that as well, or split them off and do some other projects. Um, real quick, like back, Denise was talking about their fermentus. Fermentus do okay, but if you, you compare, and actually I sort of like them because I, that, 
you got to ask yourself how much guava you actually want out of beer. Um, but you look at the at the amount of three mage that they create versus the Berkeley or Omega, and it's it's still pretty tiny, uh, but it can work. But fermentus is another option, and I should remember which one that is. Um, uh, I'm forgetting it right now, but one of them's really good at freeing them. But it makes you kind of appreciate the uh, advantages we have as home brewers. Uh, because we can get some of these things because yes, you, you can be shut down if you're planning on doing a, a, a live webinar and you want everybody to be able to have a commercial beer with New Zealand hops. Well, surprise. Ne- next time I have to start earlier and share a homebrew recipe <laughs> or wait another six months. That, well, that's, that's, that maybe is what we need to do. And, and maybe, uh, we can, we get an update on the, uh, hop harvest. Oh, uh, well, Stan, as we kind of close on that, that aspect, and it sounds like hang in there, there are more hops coming. And, and I noticed that the dates on the hops I had, they were right at a year old. Uh, but I know they'd been well taken care of, but if they were March of 2022, when can we expect to see, you know, March of 2023 hops? Um, well, I'm not sure if I, if I, in homebrew channels, um, but Hop Revolution, for instance, put there was already putting hops on the water uh, to be sent to Oregon, where Crosby Hops is going to be uh, th- that their concentrated pellets are CGX, uh, but they're much like Cryo, for instance. Um, so I'm not sure what the timing there was. Uh, YCH is thinking in terms of 2023. Hops should be available by mid June, I believe. So not that far off, and and where you start to see more of them. Um, Clayton sells through various channels, for instance. Um, so um, I I don't know exactly when I was that. I actually have an email into them. Um, and okay. Brian points out. So Brian's already got uh, some twenty three crop in stock. Ooh. I got a question for Brian, if you can answer this in the chat. So do, do you have nectar on and super delic? Um, I'm just curious. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Stan. It sounds like we should start seeing this more. So based on all your hard work that you've done, you spent all this time in New Zealand, both prepping for the trip and returning for the trip. Uh, what do you see the future I guess we're talking 2024, 25, 26 uh, for these delicious New Zealand hops. Well, first, they're going to be able to get more of uh, what's out there right now and get to know them. And I think Nectaron is it's a special hop that's going to continue to grow in popularity. Uh, but Plant Food, which is the research center, which is responsible for all these varieties, um, has a whole lineup of hops on the way possible. Let, last year, they traveled around the U.S. and did collabs with, uh, with small breweries, um, including uh, NZ102, which became Superdelic. Um, and Superdelic is a daughter of Cascade, by the way, which puts another American wild element into the hop and and it uh, has uh, quite a bit of geranial, for instance. So it's, and it, it may have tiles. Nobody's measured that yet. Uh, but they've got more on the way. Some will go through the co-op. I'm trying to understand right now uh, because the Claytons also have struck a deal with Plant and Food to get up to six new varieties. Um, then, uh, you know, the next top uh where I'd have guessed that's going maybe get an English or it, it's, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's tricky because right now it's, it's, uh, I guess code name is Peacherine and it certainly has uh, lots and lots of stone fruit. Um, and American bird like Aborado is brewed with it. I'm pretty, I'm, I'm sure that upper, uh, that, um, uh, trying to think who else. A variety of breweries on the West Coast have definitely brewed with it. Other half has brewed with it. 
So you may see Peacherine, you know, they've, they've got more on the way that way. So you're going to see more varieties trying to express these aromas and flavors that are super intense. Um, All right. But, you're going to have to pronounce that name for me again. Are you saying Peacherine? peach? It's like yeah, peach? Yeah, peach like peach, 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 E-R-I-N-E. I've um, never heard of that one. And well, it's it's just been. I'm I'm not sure the people who use it have, have advertised the name. Um, I had a <clears throat> a beer at a small brewery in New Zealand called Morning Light, and it was about three months old, and it still had a, a lot of pop to it. And in the case of that beer, I don't know. It, I I I'd, I'd have to have the the hop fresh to see if it is as intense. So it. it as we start to wrap up, it, it raises a real question at CBC, and you mentioned this earlier, you know, the thiols and the thiol positive yeast were just a huge part of so many conversations. Are we, can we get the best of both worlds if, if we use some of these thiol enhancing yeasts? I think Omega's got one, um, you know, I'm sure there's some others that have, I know White Labs, I think, has one that's kind of a hybrid. Head Berkeley, head. Has a, Berkeley has a whole series. Uh, yeah. So you can do, so, and Omega, the same thing. So you, you can get a yeast that's like Chico, but dialyzed. Um, a yeast that's uh, London 3, and therefore a hazy. Um, the one that's based, that is actually uh, this. So, so to create these yeast, they are modified. So that's that's right now only the U.S. brewers can use these yeast because in other countries they're not allowing the, the modified yeast. Um, certainly the, the people, uh, Omega is working hard to be able to put their yeast in, in other uh, places. Um, so, it, and I'd suggest looking in, in the, I guess that's a chat right now. Denise has really, has put in some really good information there about, and that's key 97, that's what I was thinking of about the fermented cheese for those of you wanting to use those. Um, and uh, which I would, when you're talking about thiols, there, there's an ongoing research because she mentioned some maturation needed uh, in order to uh, release the thiols and get the free thiols is th that's why people are looking more at how they harvest their hops um, because you're certainly getting, you'll get a, a lot more three and four, MP in Cascade hops, hops lots of people get. Home brewers, of course, can grow themselves. And you realize if you change the way you harvest that hop, you're going to get more free dials. You know, that's another example of when you have research at the top, when you have something become this popular, then you can afford to pay for the research, which everybody can benefit from. But my my question probably was a little more simplistic. As, as an engineer, I tend to take A plus B plus C, you know, and just throw everything together. So it's kind of like, man, I, I love this tropical hop characteristics. Should I, you know, find my New Zealand hops, find some fresher than what I've got right now, or maybe somebody will send me some, but, but, and then, okay, if, if Fermentis sends me some yeast that's stylized or Omega's got some, you know, is, is this something, this additive where, you know, one plus one equals two or actually maybe it gets me three or would I be better off, you know, just taking and really optimizing my New Zealand hops and a nice simple brew and then play with the thylized stuff, maybe with some other less exotic hops. What would be your recommendation? I think you can do both. Um, and you know what people are recognizing we, we haven't even talked about phantasm and phantasm is a, a powder made from sauvignon blanc grapes that have been used so used grapes this is turned into powder it it has lots of precursors um in a sauvignon blanc wine you get a lot of 4mmp that's what gives it its catty character which is it's it's not you have it austrian sauvignon blanc it's not caddy like new zealand sauvignon blanc 
you know, they're making an effort. It's the way they harvest it. Um, you know, it needs mechanical harvesting. It needs um, to be roughed up a little bit in in order to free more thiols. Um, but but anyway, for whatever reason, it appears you're getting mostly a three MH, which is what what a lot of people want versus the four MMP uh, in Phantasm, which then interacts, but it needs the dialyzed yeast in order to be free. How much guava do you want? I think that's the question. So you you certainly want to get to know these hops on their own. Um, but then you can mess around with the dialyzed yeast if you want. You know, it's an option both ways. And to me, um, yeah, these beers can get too juicy. So that's why you need some hops in there as well. Like I said, you you could just take barley malt and get a lot of guava character and a lot of Roman flavor, but you're missing, in that case, you're missing uh, the monoterpene alcohols uh, that give you fruitiness and also more just hop flavor, and you're missing the hop esters. So you still need the hops. Well, I'm cheap enough that when I brew with something expensive, I want to make sure it turns out. So it sounds to me like the best thing for me to do is is just really optimize those hops and enjoy them for what they are. And then maybe later on, we'll experiment with the thiols or yeah. thiol enhancing yeast. Right. So your prediction for 2024 and beyond, what, where do you think? You're going to see New Zealand. What, what aspects of New Zealand hops do you expect to see? Well, I, I think you're going to see them. You tell me how long people are going to want uh, super fruity IPAs. And then I can answer that question. Um, you're, you're going to, you, what you see now is not just New Zealand, but, but hop growers and dealers everywhere. Um, are much quicker to supply what brewers want and therefore what consumers want. That that would be that if you ask for something, it's a lot easier to get it now. So if you want more fruitiness, there'll be more of that. Um, you know, if you're intrigued with what Rewaka might contribute to a Kolsch and you sell a lot of Kolsch, then you'll be able to get more Rewaka for the Kolsch. I'm not sure that answered your question, but I well, no, it, it 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 tells me where's beer going to go? I, hops, much more so in the past, is there, there there's going to be a hop when when brewers say I want this much more quickly. They don't have to wait 15 years. What I hear you say is these New Zealand hop growers are getting bigger and better. Um, yeah, but I think the little guys are getting better too. Okay. You know, so, so right. almost everything you're going to get, like Nectaron, is only from the co op. So Clayton is a good thing. Clayton is actually growing maybe 80% of the Nectaron right now, maybe 75%. Uh, but, but that'll go up. So you're going to get Nectaron from small growers as well. Um, and you're going to get a cross section, which, which is an important thing. Um, like when um, I'm, I'm trying to think what I forget what the brewer said that that's not real important. A brewer goes to Hop Revolution and talks about their Nelson Sullivan and goes, you know, we just we understand why people are in love with Nelson Sullivan because it's just too big, too dank, too dominant. Then they have the Hop Revolution Nelson Sullivan that's picked earlier and they go, oh, this really works. So, for instance, for their harvest beer. Which, all, which is a beer that they brewed. They have two farms, so there's actually two beers, one unique to each farm. Um, and it was, uh, on the hot side, it was Rewaka, and it was dry hop with Nelson Sullivan. And, and the feeling is you're a little bit crazy to, to use Rewaka on the hot side because it's so dang expensive. Um, but it, it was a complex, um, had some wine-like characters, a, a really nice beer. Different than if you went 
get a uh, Nelson Sovin that is harvested really late and has more bank quality. So you're going to have a wider range and you're going to have to understand these hop varieties. You won't just say, sorry, I was bouncing my table. <laughs> I got to like that. Um, the, um, the, the point is that nectar on, and this is something that, that, that people are beginning to accept everywhere. Nectar on is not, going to be the same from every farm. Just like people like Amarillo, some people like Amarillo from Gamache Farms, some people like Amarillo from Crosby Farms, some people like Centennial from CLS, um, some people want Centennial from some other farm. And, and you will begin to see those differences, which is great. It's not so easy for home brewers because you're not going to see those differences necessarily. But for consumers and for brewers, it without adding any more cultivars, we add a lot more flavor options. Well, I, I'm not sure you answered my question, so I'll rephrase it as, as okay. we wrap up. And, and that's a good time. The questions that I want to answer. Well, that's, that's all right. I'll, I'll try and corner you as best I can. Really, my question is this. You know, I was trying to kind of see what the future is. And I, and I do understand that the varieties of hot or, or beer tastes are changing. I mean, there's, there's certainly a focus or direction towards more lagers at the moment. But I think delicious will always be delicious. And I think tropical, the unique tropical aspects of New Zealand hops are so unique that that's kind of new no matter what at, at the moment anyway. So I see room for that. But that's my opinion. You're the expert, and I just want to know, just forget the trends. What excites you personally, Dan Hieronymus, and what do you look forward to coming out of New Zealand that you kind of hope, and maybe you kind of even know that it's coming, what's exciting to you? I'm excited about these hops that get into more brewers' hands. And not to pick on you, but... But they do have this top boy. This is sensational, easy to see up front. You know, they're they're as Peter Darby said. You know, they're adding a voice to the instrumental music. You know, they and they like American hops. They can be a little bit brassy. That's cool. But as people begin to use these hops together and use these hops. Uh, for instance, along with hops from other parts of the world. Um, you know, I, I know some brewers, uh, not necessarily New Zealand hops, but are using hops that are, uh, are high in thiols and they give you lots of fruitiness and they're, they're, they have a lot of geranium and things like that. But they'll use a little bit of a, a European land race hop on the side to give you that little bit of herbal and complexity and an edge. So, what excites me is w when you've added a dozen hop varieties that are easier to get and easier to and affordable to get as as brewers work with them, the different combinations and the unique uh, aromas and flavors that they're able to create in beers. I think that's what excites me when, when you have new hop varieties. Brian uh, has refined my question a little further, and, and I would love to hear your answer if you're willing. To. Okay. Brian says, this stand, do you see a glut of New Zealand hops in the future because of all the new plantings? That's an interesting twist, twist to well, the question. Th there's a big picture there, which Brian knows because he's in the industry. How, how does this fit in with the fact that we're also uh, in the process of taking out maybe 5,000 acres, which is even if New Zealand, all of New Zealand might reach 3,000 acres. Um, and if, if growers follow what was suggested at the American Hop Convention this year, and it won't happen all this year, some's coming out this year, but within the next couple of years, we're going to eliminate 5,000 acres of citra and mosaic. Only citra and mosaic. That's it. Those coming out of the ground. So how does that fit in? So I, I can't say it's until you 
you tell me what price points they can get to and what will work for brewers and how much time brewers have to get to know these hops better and put them in brands um, and use them at a higher amount, then it would be if they're a glut. But we're talking about only such, such a small percentage of hops. Um, so, so Brian, if you can answer this on the screen, do you see there being a glut of galaxy? And, and the reason I ask that, because that, that's an example, there's about one tenth of galaxy there is of Citra. Um, no. and th th but there's a lot more galaxy than there is of any individual New Zealand variety. Exactly. So I, I, th there's, there's room for a lot more hops, but it's going to shift around what brewers use because it is a competitive landscape. Well, and again, just the uh, the challenge that I had for this webinar, finding a commercial beer that's widely distributed that had New Zealand hops. And, and I'm sure there's some out there, but at least in the week or two that I had started searching for it. And I asked a lot of people who would know and they didn't. But but I, I have to admit, I didn't ask Vinny. So it sounds like I'll have an opportunity to explore that a little yeah, bit. He, he doesn't have a is not using a lot now, but I just made some great beers with Nelson. So, um, I, I think part of them might be cause you're in South Carolina. Oh, no, no doubt. No I think doubt. there are North Carolina brewers definitely have the New Zealand. Okay. Brewers. Well, I'm going home Northeast. I'm going home brew. So without a doubt. All right. Well, Stan, this was great. And, I, and this was so much fun. I'll address something here that, that Brian brought up talking about. It. So the quality of Galaxy has been an issue, and, and, and nobody denies that. Um, and, and I think a key thing is when when you get more of a hop grown, and this has happened in New Zealand, uh, has happened in Australia. Australia is, has really upped their capacity for picking. But the fact remains that Galaxy is 58% of their acreage. And there's you're, you are picking hops in a prime time, um, maybe within seven to 10 days is when that hop needs to be picked. And th that means you've got to have capacity for that. So when a, one hop is 58% of your capacity, that is not a good thing. So more varieties and more spread out allow growers to make sure all of the hops that they're taking in a market are of a higher quality. And other parts of this, of course, are the processing, the pelleting, getting more modern uh, pelleting lines. Uh, we haven't really talked about it. I mentioned cryo, and the same thing's true with CGX. Um, and it could be if, if you're going through Haas and the Lupamax, where you're getting concentrated pellets and you're getting these other advanced hop products, which are, are more at the commercial level than they are the homebrew level, obviously. Wow, what an enlightening conversation that was with Stan Hieronymus. We journeyed through hop fields, and we touched upon the nuances of different hop varieties. We even got a glimpse of what the future holds for the industry. I want to thank you for joining me on this journey. And if you have thoughts, questions, don't hesitate to leave them in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe for more deep dives into the world of craft beer. So until next time... This is Doug Piper, and cheers.